Hey everybody, this is Robert and welcome to today's show. Now, Virology Blog was the first science website I ever followed. It's been quite a few years now and it was an inspiration to me in using the internet to disseminate information on infectious diseases and up-to-date outbreak news. Because of my guest today, I saw real value in this type of reporting or, or blogging, however you want to put it. Now, he is a pioneer in science communication online, podcasting, and generally disseminating very important and useful information. In addition, he is a world-renowned virologist, particularly in the research of poliovirus. Please welcome to the show, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology in the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Columbia University, Earth's virology professor, Vincent Racaniello, PhD. Dr. Racaniello, thanks for spending this time with me today, sir. My pleasure as always, Robert. Now, you were the keynote speaker at last year's American Society for Virology meeting, and your speech was entitled, An Inordinate Fondness for Viruses. And I, I clearly had a chuckle when I saw that, uh, which I believe sums up at, at least your professional life. Um, can you expound upon this inordinate fondness? Sure. It's a it's a little take. First, of course, it means that I have an inordinate fondness for viruses. I have developed an incredible love for them over my career. You said it's my professional life, but uh, I, I think about them all the time. They uh, are just amazing to me. So I thought that would be a cool title. It's really based on a book and a statement made by the evolutionary biologist J.B.S. Haldane, who said a long time ago, someone asked him, what does the fact that there are so many beetles on Earth mean about the creator? And Haldane said, well, uh, you know, if there were, were a creator, then that would mean that the creator has an inordinate fondness for beetles because <laughs> there's so many of them. And so... Not only do I have an inordinate fondness for viruses, but there's a ton of them out there. There are way more viruses than beetles. So I thought it was about time to update that little statement from inordinate fondness for beetles to an inordinate fondness for viruses. So that's where that comes from. Very clever and very appropriate. <laughs> um, and what I like to do on the show is I like to introduce the audience to some of the um, uh, great minds in science and, and medicine. And uh, I want well, to start that, mean, that means I have to leave now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next, turn the page. Um, <laughs> so let's start with some background. Uh, you got your doctorate in the laboratory of Dr. Peter Palise. Hope I said that right. Palaisy. Uh, Palaisy. 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 Back in the 1970s. What type of research did you do for your dissertation? Well, Peter Palaisy was and still is a great influenza virus virologist. And when I got to his lab, which was 1975, 76, he had been working on influenza viruses for a couple of years. This was at Mount Sinai in New York City. And he had developed, this is again now pre-recombinant DNA, pre-sequencing of genomes. He developed a way to map the eight RNA segments of influenza viruses and figure out what protein was coded by each one. The viruses, as you know, have eight segments of RNA, and we didn't know which each one, what each one did. So he had figured out a nice technique to do that. And when I came to the lab, I, I was really fascinated by viruses already at that time. He actually said to me, what do you want to work on? So I said, well, I'd like to take that mapping technique and use it for the influenza B viruses. And this was a group of influenza viruses, which didn't get as much respect back then. Uh, as the influenza A viruses, but now, of course, we include them in the, in the vaccines against influenza. So I said I wanted to map the genome of these viruses, and that's, he let me do it. And uh, I figured out how to separate the RNAs and figure out what proteins uh, went with each one. And then towards the end, I said I want to do the same thing for influenza C viruses. And so I did that as well. And the big surprise there was that they were missing a segment. There are only seven in the influenza C viruses. So I got a great training in basic uh, virology and he was just a fabulous mentor. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, after that, you joined the lab of David Baltimore at MIT. 
Who is David Baltimore? That name does sound familiar to, to many. <laughs> David Baltimore is a really well-known American yeah. virologist and scientist. He won the Nobel Prize in the 70s for co-discovering with Howard Temin reverse transcriptase in, in retroviruses. And when I got to his lab, he had it just been a few years since he'd won that uh, Nobel Prize. His lab was hopping, and it was just a wonderful place to be. He's a brilliant man. Is, is he still alive also? He is. He just turned 80 uh, last year. I went to his birthday party, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he's now at Caltech. Okay, good. Now, at this lab, you started um, making some serious advances on polio virus. Yeah, and, so and, when, when I went there, the moratorium, first, first of all, in the 70s, where common DNA technology had just been developed, the ability to take an RNA and clone it as a DNA copy in a bacterial plasmid and change it and sequence it. And so he said, I want you to clone the genome of poliovirus. And I did that. And it was fitting that I'm in the lab of the fellow who discovered reverse transcriptase. And of course, I'm using that enzyme to make a DNA copy of poliovirus. I cloned it in a plasmid. I determined the entire sequence of the viral RNA, 7,442 bases. Wow. And that was among the first animal virus genomes that had been sequenced. And of course, that told us how the genome was coding for proteins and so forth, how it was laid out. And then I took that plasmid that I had made of the whole genome. And David said, why don't you throw it into cells and culture and see what happens? And I said, well, nothing's going to happen. It needs a promoter. He said, no, Vinny, just do the simple experiment. So I took this plasmid, I put it in cells, and out came polioviruses. It was the first demonstration for an animal virus that you could get virus back from a cloned DNA copy of the genome. So that was a really big finding. And uh, I took that with me, of course, to my job. So I was really lucky as a postdoc. I, it was less than four years. I made two pretty important findings. And I think that um, being in a lab like David's, where there were lots of smart people around, lots of resources, really helped me do that. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And, and the work with the polio eventually became your life's work, for a better, um, lack of a better term. Absolutely. I, I took polio virus uh, with me. Now, you have to understand, when I left Peter Palazzi's lab, I had all intentions of going back to influenza virus because that was a really interesting virus as well. But after having made these discoveries with polio, I said, no, nope, I'm going to work on polio. I took it uh, with me to establish my lab here at Columbia University, and I've worked on it pretty much uh, ever since, uh, let's see, 1982 I came here. A lot of decades there, right? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Uh, it's almost uh, it's thirty eight years, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a long, long time. time. But uh, but polio virus is kind of being taken care of, uh, for lack of a better term. So you've been working on enterovirus now. Yeah. So as you know, in the eighty eight, the WHO said we're going to eradicate polio, and so I'd only been here six years. And uh, But we kept working on the virus. But in the meantime, they made pretty good progress. So last year, there were less than 200 cases of polio globally. So we've always looked at other viruses to work on. Although to this day, we still have a polio project, which is really interesting. But over the years, we've worked on rhinoviruses and other enteroviruses. We've turned to enterovirus 68, which recently has been called causing childhood paralysis. We've even worked on Zika virus. There's certainly no shortage of RNA viruses out there to work on. That, that is a fact. So you've been at Columbia since 82. Um, can you talk about some of your experiences there? I mean, you must have uh, many. I do have a lot of experiences. Someday I'm going to write a book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you write, you sit down, it makes you think back and remember things because right now I think everything in the past is kind of fuzzy but uh, some of the experiences well I came here and my chairman said here's your lab and he and he left and it was up to me to get, <laughs> to get the lab started it's an empty room mm -hmm. so I had to figure out how to do things you learn how to go to your colleagues and ask for help uh, and then I got my first people I had no shortage of projects but I had I had to get people to work on them I got the first people in my lab I was lucky for many many years to have wonderful graduate students mm -hmm. and a couple of postdocs to do the work and no shortage of problems to work on. So I, I always found challenging 
how to train people and get them to be good scientists, to motivate them, to be respectful of others. And that's a, that's a challenge. And so I think most of the time it worked, but, but not always. Uh, and, I, and I've found that over the years, getting uh, financial support for your work is not easy. Uh, so it's important to, uh, to push your work forward, to talk about it, uh, and to, to write about it. And so those are the challenges, I think, in, in being uh, an independent investigator. And I think it's harder now because money is tighter, mm -hmm. jobs are tighter, and people coming in the fields now are going to have different challenges. Well, not, not only are, are you uh, a researcher, but uh, you're also a teacher, and I'm sure you enjoy that aspect also. I love teaching. I, you yeah. know, I didn't realize when I started that I would love teaching so much. But when I did, even as a graduate student, I remember when I gave talks, I really enjoyed talking. I really enjoyed being clear in my talks. People always said I gave good talks. And uh, so over the years, I always, I always accepted invitations to, to teach or to talk. And then at uh, some point in the 90s, I was asked to join a team that was writing a virology textbook, and that became Principles of Virology. And it's now, uh, we're working on the fifth edition, so it's done very well. And I've used that to create a virology course uh, here at Columbia University. And I ab I'm teaching it right now. I teach in the spring semester. I absolutely love teaching virology. I'm passionate about viruses. Of course, I'm crazy about them, but mm -hmm. I can convey that to the students. And here they can have someone who has spent his life doing research on viruses teach them about it and they really enjoy that and it's a very oh, yeah. popular course so you know i am at a medical school which is basically like a research institute you really should do research and raise money to do that and teaching is not a primary focus but uh, i i just love teaching and if i were to do my career again i probably would go to an undergraduate institution where i could teach more yeah yeah i've heard other people say that also um, you know, another of your passions and really how I discovered you um, many years ago now <clears throat> was virology and microbiology media, uh, thanks to the Internet. In, in fact, um, I was following virology blog. That was the first mm. <laughs> website that I followed as far as the science, science website. Neat. And, I, and I'm not sure if you know this, but the July 4th weekend of 2013, mm -hmm. Um, you were my first radio guest, and we talked about MERS about one year into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were the first one because of virology blog. I said, "Oh, cool." Well, and I, I want to talk about MERS, but well, there's this guy that runs this blog. Let me contact him, <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's really how. So it's it's amazing what these things can really do, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> a great story. And I've yeah. talked to you many times over the years for your radio many program, times. right? Yeah, yeah. And so you started the the virology blog and the mid 2000s sometime um Is that 2000 and let's see 2006 i think something yeah, like that yeah so it's been a long time you you were one of the first as far as i can tell um mm -hmm. what was your goal at the time and how surprised are you that it did so well and then led to all these other opportunities that you're involved in now well the reason i started it was we had just finished writing the first edition of this virology textbook and the way the book is written I had to write about a lot of viruses that I wasn't necessarily working on and learned about them I had all this knowledge I said I want to I want to share this and our publishing contract allows us to you know, put material from the book online and at that point blogging had become easy you know WordPress was around it was easy to get a, a hosting provider mm -hmm. and so I thought why don't I start writing a blog and just take parts of my uh, book and publish that. So I started doing that. And the first post was something like, you know, uh, our virus is alive or something like that. And I had no idea where it would go. But amazingly, people started reading it and leaving comments. I was just, <laughs> you know, 10, 20 comments per article. So I started at first it was rather infrequent. But then uh, I started writing more and more. And of course, the more you write, the more people read. And now still, I'm still doing it. I do it once a week. I write something. I still have a really big audience uh, reading that. And I've been able to to get two other people uh, to write on the, on the uh, site as well to, to do their own thing. And I'm amazed always at how many people actually read it. So my original goal was simply to teach people about viruses. I wanted to write because I, I do like writing very much. 
but it introduced me to this whole world of social media. And of course, that led to doing uh, podcasts uh, and video and Twitter, YouTube and Facebook mm -hmm. and all of that. And I found that that was a great outlet for teaching science to people. Yeah, and I, and I can I can speak for myself. You were really an inspiration for me to to get involved in the different types of medium. Also, um, can you talk about the importance of this medium, the internet and the social media, and um, including the podcasting and, and the various videos and stuff that you do? Well, uh, first of all, it's important to to realize that science is really important for everybody's lives. The way we live today. The, the longevity, our health, the, all the gadgets that we have, all of that is because of science. But I think few people understand that and appreciate it. So it's really important for scientists to talk about what they do so people learn it. Pre-internet, you couldn't do very much in terms of communicating science. Right. You, know, you, could, you could write books, you could give talks, you could go to schools, for example, but you never reached that many people. And it was typically local, but the internet changed all that because uh, now you have not only websites, which are great and you can reach a lot of people. And, and now the cool thing about uh, websites is that everybody looks at them on their mobile devices, right? It used mm -hmm. to be you were chained to a desktop. Now 80% of uh, web traffic is mobile. People That's read right. your, you know, you read your blog while they're waiting in line. That's great. And then of course uh, the, the internet enables social media, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram people sharing things quite readily, uh, and podcasts. And all of this stuff democratizes knowledge. And what that means is anybody mm -hmm. that wants to publish something can do it. So in my book, scientists have this great audience out there. They can teach the world, basically. You pick your medium. You can write. You can do podcasts. You can do uh, videos. You can go on social media and talk to people. You just pick your medium and it's easy to do. It's inexpensive. You know, for podcasts, you don't need a radio station. You don't have to have a transmitter. You can just do it in your office mm -hmm. and put it out there and people can listen to it and consume it. So and it's so for science communication, it's perfect. And it's also bad because you have a lot of people out there who don't know anything and who are expressing their opinions. And they are apparently on an equal footing as the experts. And that's the problem both the, the the blessing and the curse of the internet. Yeah. yeah, that's really how it works too. Boy, I I got a lot of uh, I have a Facebook page that has nearly seventy thousand people on it, and uh, the anti-vaccine crowd comes out in force. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely. Just, but uh, I, I don't I don't block anybody unless they get get dirty and nasty. So I just let them do their thing. There's people on there that are pro-vaccine that counter them, and they just watch them go to battle, and it's it's. Um, it's fun. It's fun to watch, I think. Um, let's go ahead and switch gears to virology, your topic. Um, many changes in the field and very rapidly. Uh, what was the most significant advance that you've seen in your career? That's a tough question, Robert, because since I've been around a bit, uh, a lot of things have happened that have been yeah. really, really important. Well, it can be more than one, Dr. Uh, I mean, the first one that really affected me was, of course, uh, recombinant DNA technology, the ability to make DNA copies of any RNA or DNA and amplify them and modify them. And we use that to this day, of course. It's revolutionized research. It's revolutionized uh, the pharma industry. You can make therapeutic products that way and so forth. So that is the one I've known the longest. It enabled me to make a DNA copy of poliovirus and determine its sequence and make it infectious and all that. So that would have to be at the top of the list. But, uh, you know, I've also seen polymerase chain reaction developed in my career, and that's been huge, of course, mm -hmm. as well in research and diagnostics. Uh, but I, I also I think that I would make number two probably genome sequencing. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when I was in the, the Baltimore lab, it was in its infancy, and I used it in a very crude form. I have to tell you, I sequenced the genome of poliovirus, 7,442 nucleotides. It took me a year to do that because I did it by myself by hand, and that's how you did it back then. Yeah. Nowadays, of course, it could be done in half an hour. You would mail, you would mail the DNA to a company, and they would give you the results the next day. And that has transformed the way we look at viruses because when I started my lab, 
realistically, I could only work on one virus, polio virus, because that's all you could sequence. It takes so long to do that. But now mm -hmm. you can work on thousands of polio viruses. You could go around the world and collect isolates and sequence them all and compare them. And that's totally revolutionized virology. So I'd have to say sequencing would be a close number two. You know, you have to get uh, DNA copies of genomes before you can sequence them. But sequencing has made huge contributions to understanding you know, epidemiology, pathogenesis, evolution of viruses, stuff we never knew before. So you're up at Columbia University. For people that don't know where that is, that's in New York City. Um, so Dr. Racaniello, right in your backyard right now, you got uh, a pretty large measles outbreak um, for the United States, for sure. Um, what are your thoughts on what's going on with measles throughout the country? This is a, a virus which shouldn't be around because we've had a vaccine since the 60s. Mm -hmm. It's the same vaccine. It's a great vaccine. It works really well. It doesn't harm you in any way. And so all of these cases are inexcusable in my view, should not be happening. They're totally vaccine preventable. And they're arising, of course, because in both cases, in Rockland County and in Brooklyn, we have religious groups whose leaders are suspicious of the vaccine. And of course, the members of the religious groups listen to their leaders, and so they don't vaccinate their children. But there is no reason not to use measles vaccine. You know, it had some very bad press uh, in the in the 90s because of Andrew Wakefield's suggestion that it might be causing autism, but his studies have been thoroughly debunked. And many, many studies have been done since then, which clearly show that the virus vaccine, the measles virus vaccine, is not in any way connected to autism. Yet this persists, people still think, and that's why they're uh, suspicious of it. So I'm very sad when I see these kids getting measles because it's totally preventable. The vaccine will not harm you in any way. It's easy to get, and it, it could kill you. Measles can cause encephalitis in one in a thousand infected kids. So I think this is not ending yet. I think even, and I'm very happy to see New York uh, City and Rockland County take measures to tell people that you have to be immunized. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be over uh, anytime soon. I think it's going to get worse for a while because there are just pockets of people throughout this country, throughout the world, who simply are suspicious of the vaccine. And we have to get a message to them that it's okay. And, you know, that's part of what I've been trying to do over the years uh, with podcasting and so forth. But I need more than myself. I need other people to help in this. And I always tell people, go out and tell 10 people that it's it's okay to get this vaccine. It's really something that shouldn't be happening in 2019. Uh, you know, Wakefield planted that seed, and I think it's going to be really difficult to totally turn this around. I mean, people... It's remarkable. It's remarkable, I, really. Totally, yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I, let me throw it out there anyway. There's a lot, there's some controversy concerning uh, some of the news media talking about immigrants from Central America bringing enterovirus D68 into this country and causing the 2014 AFM outbreak and subsequent years. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that's a crazy idea because, you know, entero D68 was first isolated in California in 1962. Yeah. And so uh, it's always been around. In fact, I'm sure it was around before that. We just didn't notice it. Uh, why we had an outbreak in 2014 uh, is a really good question. It certainly wasn't brought over any border because we've had it here and it's present in, in many other countries uh, throughout the globe. But it's very curious. We had an outbreak then. We had another one in 2016 and another one in 2018. Uh, I don't really understand why we're having outbreaks now and, and why we didn't have before it. Maybe we never detected it. But the idea that it came over the border, uh, I think it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm, we're in the same. You're, you're preaching to the choir on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I don't know if you can intellectually narrow this one down, but Dr. Racaniello, what virus or group of viruses do you find the most important today and into the near future? Oh, probably the ones we haven't discovered yet. Yeah. 
right? They're the ones out there in, in animals that are going to infect us and uh, cause outbreaks. So, you know, importance in terms of human disease, I think the, the potential zoonotic viruses in uh, bats or some other animal um, or bird, water birds for influenza viruses. But in terms of uh, research importance, I think that these really giant viruses uh, that have been discovered have stimulated a whole new area uh, of virus research. And the idea that viruses could have such big particles, could have such big genomes, some of them have two and a half million base pairs of DNA with 1,600 potential proteins. And the amazing part is they, they code for proteins and nucleic acids that we never thought were in viruses. So they've changed the way we look at virus evolution and we, it's changed the way we think uh, vi how big viruses can get. And I think uh, and that's stimulated a lot of people to get into that particular field and it's just going to keep growing. So I, I will take those two. For human viruses, the important ones are the ones we haven't found. And for, for research... Uh, that helps us illuminate where viruses came from, the big viruses. People have, I've, I've had interviews with the press and they, they say, well, what's so important about these giant viruses? Because they don't infect people. And I say, if you really want to understand how viruses work, you need to understand where they came from and studying these giant viruses will help you do that. All right, last question. Um, you had this incredible career in virology, microbiology, immunology. Dr. Racaniello, what advice would you have for any aspiring virologist and microbiologist? Well, you have to make sure that microbiology and virology is what you really want to do. And I didn't know when I graduated college, I graduated in uh, 1974 from Cornell. I went home with a bachelor's degree not knowing what I wanted to do. I had some idea that I would like microbiology, so I got a job in a microbiology lab, streaking out bacteria and identifying them, 1975. And, uh, you know, but Robert, I recently visited the clinical micro lab here at the hospital. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, things, it's, have, things have changed. <laughs> oh, my gosh. They have a mass spec that can identify a colony in 20 minutes, right? Malditoff. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That, that stint for a year in that micro lab made me confident. I loved working in the lab. Things worked. My hands, you know, could, could handle it. So that made the difference for me. So I would say, first of all, you have to work in a lab for a while to make sure it's what you want. And then if you find that, in fact, virology and microbiology is for you, you better make sure you're, you have two things. You have to have curiosity. You have to want to know uh, how everything works. And you have to have passion which means you'll do anything uh, to get the work done. And I think if you have those two uh, attributes, then, then you can go long uh, in the field. And then in the end, the most important thing you can do is to impart that curiosity and passion uh, to somebody else. That's what my mentors did for me. And that's what I hope that I've done uh, for the scientists that I've trained. Great answer, really good answer. All right. Well, Dr. Vincent Racaniello, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your story today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Been a pleasure, Robert. All right. Take care of yourself. Yep. And don't forget to check us out at the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, the podcast, Outbreak News Interviews, which can be found on the website, on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and Spotify, and the Outbreak News This Week radio show, which is aired Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time in the Tampa Bay area on AM 1380 The Biz, or online streaming at 1380thebiz.com. And check out our social media presence, Facebook, at Infectious Disease News, and Twitter, at BackDman63. Outbreak News TV is a production of The Global Dispatch. Copyright, The Global Dispatch, Incorporated, 2019.